Well, welcome everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is, what is it, Gan, the fourth one in the series? Or webinar Correct. Series? Okay, yeah. so the fourth one. By the way, is this, Gan, do you know, is this popping back and forth depending on who's talking? Yes. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, I'm not sure. Okay, cool. Um, so for those of you who don't know, this is like the fourth one in the webinar series. Uh, we started with um, uh, the product research phase, we found a product. We are doing uh, marshmallow sticks, so like long bamboo skewers. And we, uh, after we found the product, we worked on locating some suppliers. And then uh, now I'm in the process of negotiating with these suppliers. So, yeah, so I've been in contact with four different factories. Um, for those of you that either follow the blog post or uh, the webinar series, I had a total of six different samples actually. Um, from those six, only four have actually been good about communicating with me about an actual order. So I've been working with four of them uh, to get pricing, to kind of work with them to see on uh, just how they do with their communication skills, how easy they are to work with. And I'm actually, I'm gonna share my screen with you here and show you um, let's see here. Let me know when you can see when my screen's live again. Yep, looks good. Okay, cool. So for those of you who can see this, um, it is just a Google Sheet that I created. And what I did is I just, I just put a little note, uh, a few notes about each factory in here. So um, I've been communicating with them both over uh, email and through Skype. Skype is a lot quicker if you are or you can stay up for some hours that they're on uh, for our friends either in Asia or Australia or whatever, that's pretty easy for you guys. Um, over here in the Americas, it's a little more difficult. You have to stay up late or wake up early. But um, essentially just to keep things organized, and this isn't even, uh, as you can see, it's not even that neat of a spreadsheet here. I just jotted down which factory it was, their names, contact info, and a few notes about things that they were telling me. Uh, since I was getting those from multiple emails and Skype, um, so yeah, as you can see here, uh, a factory one, two, three, and five, and these are the same numbers as the factories that I labeled uh, in the blog post. So if you remember in the blog post, factory three was my favorite as far as the sample that I received. I felt that the quality of the bamboo was the highest, and I really liked the packaging that they sent me. But if we look at the price here, um, over $12,000 landed cost for a thousand units. So it works out to be about 12 bucks a pop or over $12. Um, and they're significantly higher than the other factories. So I've kind of ruled them out. Um, so that leaves us with factory one, two, and five. Of those, the price is pretty competitive. Um, so if you guys remember, um, I would really like to ship this product via air. And that's just because it's a lot easier. I don't have to go through the headaches of using a freight forwarder and a customs broker and stuff. And it's a lot quicker. And for this particular case study, it takes about a month as well as more time for um, obviously to manufacture the product. And there's usually like you know, it seems like if the boat's leaving on Tuesday that my product always gets done on like, or if boats leave every Tuesday, my product always gets done like on Wednesday. So that adds like an extra week. Then on top of that, sometimes it gets stuck in customs, so on and so on. So I'd really like to ship this air. So, you know, in my total price here, this is both the price of the product and the air shipping for a thousand units. Um, so factory one was going to, was charging me $1.95 per unit. Uh, factory two was charging me um, 264 per unit, and factory five is 250 per pack. So it ranges from $1.95 to uh, 264. And then obviously if you, if you do the math, that's only like $2,000 or $2,600 in the actual product cost, and the rest is shipping. So for this particular product, shipping costs us uh, twice or maybe three times as much as the actual unit cost. Um, so this would obviously be a great candidate for an item that you would want to ship ocean freight. It's just, for the reasons I just stated, um, for this first order, I'd really like to ship this one air as long as I can still make a profit on it, which I can. Um, 
So yeah. What, so what those I, prices, I assume, are not negotiated at all, right? Th that's what they quoted you initially? Good question. So after speaking with each of these factories, um, factory two has been my favorite. She's been the nicest to work with. Um, she sent me lots of pictures, which I like, and a few other things. Um, so actually, and I forgot to delete this, but the initial price she quoted me was $3.50. Hey, Greg, sorry, real quick, is it possible that you zoom in because people are really curious about the spreadsheet and then maybe later you can uh, go over what information you're tracking in there? Yeah, so maybe you can see this a little bit better now. Um, so this is actually, <laughs> I to be honest with you, I usually make a little bit nicer spreadsheet than this. I was kind of rushing through this a little bit. So this is actually a really ugly, disorganized spreadsheet. Um, all I have in here is just and I was literally just copy and pasting this. As you can see, it's not nicely formatted at all. So I literally just copied and pasted the, the agent name, the salesperson name I was working with, their website, um, their email or their Skype ID. And then I, I was just copy and pasting notes out relative out of the Skype um, call or out of their email. So yeah, um, looking at this now, I should have spent about 10 minutes before this webinar to kind of neaten things up, but you get the idea. Um, so yeah, you know, it doesn't need to be anything fancy, just a few notes so you can easily compare factories. So yeah, so my favorite factory was this one, factory number two, but after talking with these people, she was the, the nicest to work with and I felt like had a good quality product. Um, but she quoted me $3.50, which is quite a bit more than say factory one, which was only $1.95 per bag or per, per product. So that's packaging plus 110 bamboo sticks. Um, so then after talking with her a little bit more, I just said, look, um, you know, price isn't the only important thing to me. I value good quality and, you know, someone that's uh, easy to work with. However, your price is significantly higher. Um, I've been quite quoted other prices from $1.90 to $2.50 or something. I was like, you know, I'd like to work with you, but at the price you've quoted me, it's just not gonna be possible. So then she came back and she said, okay, well, you know, I really value this. I, I think I can do it $3, you know, so I said, okay, thanks for the quote. Um, unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to work with you. Uh, essentially, have a nice day, bye. Um, so then, you know, like a few hours later, she came back and she said, okay, well, this, this really is the best price I can do. I can do $2.64. So that's how I got to that. And then, I don't know, maybe if I pushed her harder, maybe I could get that even cheaper. But at that point, I was like, okay, you're still the most expensive, but like I said, you know, I wasn't kidding her when I said I'd also do value high quality and uh, someone that's nice to work with. So at that price, um, you know, I thought it was a reasonable price, something that I could still make a profit on, so I was happy enough with that one. So, um, yeah, any comments in the, in the chat box so far again? Or quick yeah, things so why I'm at this point. Uh, Marshall asked, when you say air shipping, do you mean air shipping as cargo or air express shipping like UPS or DHL? Good question. So yeah, I'll go over that right now. So for those of you uh, that don't know, there's essentially two different types. Air cargo um, is usually a little less expensive. And actually, to be completely honest with you, I don't even know all the details of it because I rarely ship air cargo. But for this particular product, since it is so big and heavy, I asked him to give me both prices for air cargo and, um, you know, uh, like express air shipments, which is, you know, your DHL or UPS or FedEx or whatever. Um, and just to give you an idea, like from this factory right here, I think to ship the whole, all, so I, was, I, was, I put 10 packs in a case. So to ship 100 cases with 10 packs each, it was going to cost me like, roughly $5,000 via uh, air cargo, or I forget, like eight or $9,000 via Express, which I think she was gonna ship at DHL. So uh, the air cargo was gonna take, I think like 15 days, and the Express usually takes, it's pretty quick, like two, three, four days. So this price that I'm showing you, so after I saw that, what I decided was, okay, I really want some products as, fat, as quickly as I can get them. So I asked him to ship me 10 cases express and the other 90 cases air cargo. And what this will do is it will get me 10 cases within a few days of them being completed at manufacturing. 
Um, with those, I can go ahead and take pictures and I can go ahead and try to get some units into Amazon as quickly as possible. And then the other ones will arrive like a week or two later from the air cargo. Um, this is both because, like I said, for this particular case study, I'm trying to move things along pretty quickly uh, so that we don't get bored with it. And also because there is an opportunity cost, you know, if we sell 10 units a day at $7 profit a unit, you know, that is $70 profit a day. If I were to wait 10 more days, that's $700 in potential profit loss, which, you know, that more than covers the additional cost of the express shipment for the first 10 cases. So, um, you know, that, so that's how I can justify that. Got it. So it, from that, it, uh, somebody was asking, is there a better option between the two? Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? So the, uh, you, kind of like I said, it, one last thing I need to throw in there, a lot of times when you get air cargo uh, quotes, they, they'll give you the quote that doesn't include, it's not door to door. You'll have to pick up the air cargo shipment at your local airport. Um, so I asked for an air cargo shipment door to door. So that includes the custom fees, uh, the freight forwarding you know, from the airport to my house. That is a door to door service. It's just gonna take longer. So the advantage is the express shipment uh, is quicker um, than the air cargo and there is an additional price on that. Um, and like I said, to be honest with you, I think I've only shipped something air cargo like one other time in my life. I normally just go DHL because a lot of times if it's big and heavy like this product, I do uh, ship ocean freight. So um, there might be some other fine details that I'm not forgetting just because I'm not that familiar with the air cargo. Um, I usually just ship things express, which is, you know, like DHL, UPS, whatever, or ocean freight. So, um, yeah, I mean, this, this is actually probably gonna be a little bit of a, a learning experience, the air cargo thing for me as well. And I'll share whatever I learned on it. Awesome. So just to clarify, you, you're doing door to door. Um, so you are, can you describe that process? You're doing it for photos or quality assurance or checking or, um, what's your rationale there? Okay, so yeah, when I say door to door, that includes, um, that's just the term that they use that, you know, like I want an all inclusive fee for everything that it costs from get it from, the, you know, your factory to my house or warehouse or whatever. So that's when I, what I mean when I say door to door. Um, because other times, you know, if you're not clear on that, they can ship it from their door, you know, their warehouse to like the airport, which then would, usually doesn't include customs or, um, you know, freight forward and getting it from the airport to your house. So that's what I mean by door to door. But yeah, the reason I'm shipping it to uh, my house as opposed to into Amazon um, is, and I, I do this with all my, it's my understanding that some people ship stuff directly to Amazon, which uh, I've heard actually recently that people have, have having some problems with that. I've never done it. I would ship everything straight to my house. It gets inspected and then I forward it onto Amazon myself. Okay. And in yeah. that process, um, are you using a customs broker for the air cargo? No, they are handling that and that's included in the price. Okay. Uh, and then regarding the price so of the shipping. My, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, it's not my uh, customs broker or freight forwarder. They're the door to door service that they quoted me includes that. Got it, okay. And then did you do any reference checks or get your own quotes? Because you said that one supplier was very expensive. Um, like, do you do any legwork on finding your own or bill to receiver? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I have not done that yet. However, in the agreement that I send them, um, and this is also something I can do just before I send them the agreement. Uh, I just haven't got a chance to do it yet. but. In the agreement that I send, I'm going to say, if I choose to do so, I can use my own, um, like say, you know, I get a quote with my DH account and it's a lot cheaper than it, they gave me, then I could say I have uh, the right to use my shipping company of choice. Great. And then at what point do you take your product photos? Yes, yeah, so this is another great thing about the express shipment. So essentially what's going to happen is 
I'm going to receive 10 cases, you know, express. So they'll get there a few days after they're done being manufactured. At that point, right away, I'm going to get a few of these products to my photographer to take photos of. Um, I don't need a delay sending my stuff in there. So I'll probably go ahead and create a listing and we'll do this together on a webinar like next week or the following week or whatever. I'll go ahead and create a listing with just like one crappy photo. Um, for instance, like, let's see, like with just with uh, this photo or something, I'll go ahead and just create a listing or with no photos. I can't remember if it requires you to have a photo or not, but if it doesn't, like no photos, uh, I'll go ahead and ship it into Amazon since it takes a few days. And then my photographer has a quick enough turnaround time that by the time it gets into Amazon, I can swap out the photos for the good ones. Does that make sense? Yeah. So as soon as uh, the other option is, you know, I never received a sample of the packaging that I was using and I actually never received the 90 centimeters by five millimeter diameter with the uh, pointed tip that I wanted on it. I never received that particular sample. If I did, I could go ahead and start getting some photos right now. But um, for those of you guys who were with us before or saw the blog post, I was actually in a hotel in China when I got these samples and um, I, I had them rush them to me in just a few days, so they actually didn't have the time to, you know, like from this particular factory, I didn't get a, uh, the exact product that I wanted to buy from them. It was, I think it was like 70, from this factory, I think it was like 75 centimeters uh, with the correct diameter. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I could have probably taken some photos of that, but like I said, I was in uh, my hotel in China. Got it. Hey Greg, can we take a step back for people who aren't in the U.S.? Uh, would it make sense for them to send the uh, shipment to their house, say in Canada or somewhere in Europe, um, for the increased cost, or do you think that's something better for just U.S. sellers, people abroad, to just sell, uh, have it shipped directly to Amazon uh, warehouses? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um... So I don't have a ton of experience in this because I am US based, so I've never done this myself, but it's my understanding that you have two options, which would be to ship it directly to the Amazon fulfillment centers. Um, to go along with that, I have heard that like just recently within the past few weeks or months that people have started to have more and more problems with that. Um, I even heard, I don't know if it's true or not, that DHL will no longer ship to Amazon fulfillment centers just because it was too often that products were arriving there um, with uh, duties unpaid. Um, another option you have is to use a, a freight forwarder inspection service that special, or it doesn't have to, but a lot of them actually specialize in uh, shipments for Amazon. So you can mail it to one of them and then they will forward it on to the Amazon warehouses for you. Once the product is fully packaged and com complete. Yes. Is there, do you have an opinion on a, an ideal point in inspection as far as like uh, mid production or after it's uh, produced but not packaged or all of them or what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, good question. So for our particular product, I'm actually not going to uh, get a third party inspection. Um, I, I'm kind of lackadaisical about this and I'm probably starting to play with fire a little bit, but I haven't been like burned on it yet. Um, I put quite Good a bit of the marshmallow sticks. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, I I like to think that I do a pretty good job in vetting these factories. And the other thing that I'm going to have them do when I send them an agreement before I actually put down a deposit is I, I'm going to send them a little. Uh, purchase order agreement and in there I'm gonna require them to take photos at like five different parts or ten different parts along the process so in there I'm gonna say I want a photo um, of the raw materials before you start production I want a photo once you like cut the bamboo sticks I want a photo uh, after you sharpen some of the ends on there to um, agree to that I want a photo uh, of the are the labels before you stick them on the, the actual uh, plastic bags. I want a photo uh, after you've completed the packaging, and then I want a photo again of the uh, full case before you ship it to me. 
And then from that, the nice thing, you know, it's like if you pick simple products, uh, like our bamboo sticks, it's pretty hard to mess up too much. I, I feel like I could see from all these photos if something was terribly wrong, and then, um, uh, yeah, and then hopefully correct it, you know, without a third party inspection. If you are doing something more complicated, like especially like electronic types of items, that would be um, an opportunity, you know, a good case to get a third party inspection. So, yeah. Okay, and yeah, we will share that purchase order agreement, um, and we'll, we'll share the Google Doc that uh, Greg was going over to evaluate the different suppliers. Uh, so just keep an eye on the blog soon. Uh, so Greg, a couple of people were curious about the product photos. Uh, do you have a, a person that you'd recommend or a company, and how much you're willing to pay for a photo? Good question. So. Actually, the, the person I've been using for a long time um, no longer is doing it. So I'm actually personally in the market for a, a new photographer. Um, Gen and I are going to look into this in the next week or so, but there's a few people that kind of specialize in it and just for Amazon sellers. We may choose to use one of them or may try to find someone locally. Um, the good thing about someone locally is like we could deliver it to their house and they could come pick it up like the same day it gets in from um, from China, so that'd be pretty cool. Um, as far as costs, expect to spend like 200 bucks or so. Um, and I wouldn't cheap out on that because good photos are really important and they make a big difference on how well your item sells. So it's, it's not an area to pinch pennies. If there's someone really good, especially local, that um, you know is going to do a great job. Don't be scared to even spend more money than two hundred dollars. But that's about what I've been spending. Um, I think some people have been getting them cheaper. But like I said, it's, it's not a good spot to pinch pennies. So you're saying that would be about twenty five dollars per photo, or two hundred dollars per photo? Two hundred dollars total, and I usually get like five or six photos out of that. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, for example, for this. Like, how would you get your product photo ideas? Like, how many different ways are you going to get start a campfire and do something in action, or just product itself, packaging? Yeah, it's a really great uh, question, and it differs per product. Um, obviously, for this product, you know, like more complicated products, especially if there's like multiple pieces, they're good because you can take separate photos, kind of each piece, and then one with all of them. Uh, for this product, and I'd work with my photographer with this because they usually have really good ideas. But um, you know, I'm gonna do one product or one photo of like the entire product in the packaging. I'm gonna do one photo that shows probably like a bundle to show, and it'd be good if I get something in there to, like as relation to see that like these are pretty big sticks and they're long. Um, I'll have one close up of just the points, and then yeah, it'd be great if I could get a, a lifestyle photo in there of maybe a cute little kid roasting a marshmallow or something. And a lot of times these aren't actually, if your photographer is really good and really good with Photoshop, a lot of times like we don't actually have to go out and light a fire, especially because I imagine campfires are something that are, are really hard to get good photos of. Um, if your photographer is really good and they're really good with Photoshop, then a lot of times you can Photoshop in like your product into like an uh, existing campfire photo. Um, Very good. Now I say this, um, I've seen it done poorly before as well, like photoshopping into a lifestyle photo, and I think that's worse than, uh, I mean, you just have to use your judgment, but it's important to get someone really good when you're doing something like that. Sure. Now, what about video? I've never done any videos, um, so no, we won't be doing any for this, and that's a whole other thing about um, having listings that you can put videos on. But no, we're not going to be doing any videos for this product. Okay. I, I see a question. I guess one of your products is stainless water bottles. No, this isn't my product. This is a, <laughs> a hydro product flat. Place. So 200 bucks is for, I usually get like five or six photos in uh, really high res. Um, I forget the exact dimensions, but they're like 2,000 by 2,000 pixels or something. So they're like huge, so you can, you can hover over them and zoom in. 
So yeah, what um have are there some more questions? Ever, to, go ahead again. Yeah, Greg, um, have you ever used Amazon's photo service or heard anything about it? And to be honest, I didn't know they had a photo service, but I would guess that it wouldn't quite be up to my standards. Like I said, I, I put a lot of emphasis in good photos and um, I know the photos that like Amazon takes for their own products usually aren't that good. I like to do ones a lot better than that. So uh, I don't know anything about it though, to be honest with you. Okay. Great, so then getting back to where we're at with um, putting in the order, um, have, are, are there other steps that you haven't covered yet? Yeah, good question. So um, I pretty much decided on, what did I say, it was factory two, right? Um, let me pull up my doc here. Uh, I'll go ahead and screen. Or, yes, I pretty much decided on factory two. They happen to be the lowest total price, but that isn't the only deciding factor for me. Even, and hopefully my sales uh, agent isn't watching this, but even actually if they charge like say $500 more, so it'd be like 50 cents per unit more, um, I would still be going with them to be honest with you, just because she's been really great to work with, um, super quick. She sends me lots of photos, which I really like. Like, let me actually go ahead and share my screen with you again. Um, and just like when I have questions about things, she's always just quick to send me a photo, which is really nice. So this is a little file of just all the photos she sent me. So um, I asked, like, have you ever done any long bamboo sticks like this before in this diameter and similar length? And she said, yeah, let me go take a photo for you. So she took a photo and she brought this back to me. I was like, okay, cool. Um, you know, that's pretty nice. I'm happy to see that you've done something similar before. And then I said, you know, like, what kind of tips do those have on it? And, you know, instead of describing, she goes and takes me a quick photo. So she shows me these tips. I'm like, great, those are the same ones that I want. Um, when we're talking about, let's see if I can rotate this. Uh, maybe not. When we're talking about the size of the sticker I was going to put on the bag. I was like, okay, well, how big is the bag? Because I want you know, I want a sticker that's not quite as big. So she went and measured out. So this is a sample bag underneath it. This would be the width of our bag. And this is the size uh, sticker on there, uh, 100 millimeters by 140 millimeters. So I was like, can't, and actually I didn't even ask her for this. She just laid it on this bag and was like, this is what it would look like. I was like, okay, that looks cool. Um, then she showed me like, oh, we, you know, these stickers come in 100 by 140 millimeters. Uh, will those work for you? And I was like, as long as the adhesive is good enough that you, you know they're not going to fall off the bag. Um, so she assured me that's the case. I was like, okay, those look good. Um, I asked. She said for this length, ninety centimeters. So let's see these. Uh, this sample right here, um, you can see they have like this resealable end. I was like, okay, cool. Can we get those with ours? So she contacted the bag manufacturer and she said the longest they can do is. Or the longest they have in stock is 80 centimeters. Um, if you want to wait like three weeks, they can make custom bags for you. I was like, well, what can they do now? I don't want to wait three weeks. And I, I don't know if I told you this, guys, but um, she also said that they can create this order in 10 or 15 days, which is actually really fast. Most orders in China, from my experience, take like a whole month. So that was another reason I really like this factory. But um, she said, if we don't want to wait for these custom bags to be manufactured, they can just seal the ends like this. So again, she sent me this photo. So I was like, okay, I think the sealed ends will be fine. Um, I don't want to wait the additional time because I'm trying to get this to market as quickly as possible. Um, yeah, she sent me this about like the location of the sticker on the actual bag. Uh, sent me this sample of some color stickers that they've printed. Um, so yeah, you know, I like that. Um, so that, you know, that makes it again, nice to work with her that she's sending me these photos. Um, it's a little good as, you know, especially if, um, there's a little bit of language barrier, which isn't sure her English is great, but yeah, I like seeing those pictures. Awesome. Uh, so where are okay, we? Okay. So I guess I got a little off topic there, didn't I? So that was the, <laughs> <laughs> those are the reasons that I chose factory Two. Um, so I really like her. 
like I said, for those reasons, quick lead time, competitive price. Uh, actually, the overall price is the cheapest, which is a good thing. So those are the reasons I'm going with her. I'm going to try tonight, actually, to finalize the deal. So I'm going to put together a little contract. In that contract, and again, I'm, I'll share this with you, and I, I threw together just a few uh, bullet points of items that I'm going to include. So again, I'm gonna share my screen. And in there are, I'm gonna include these items. So I'm gonna put a very thorough description of the goods, so that's gonna be the size and um, the length, the type of the point. I'm gonna put a picture of the point to make sure we're clear on that. Uh, the grade of the materials, the thickness of the bag, the length of the bag, the size of the, the sticker, how many colors are going to be on my sticker. I'll probably put some kind of clause in there about um, that I require. And I'd have to look at how I'm going to word this. But essentially, I'm going to require that the sticker doesn't come off in shipment and can withstand a certain uh, heat. So even if it's like 100 degrees Fahrenheit or... Uh, zero degrees Fahrenheit that the, the sticker or the bag doesn't become brittle or loses the adhesiveness. Um, and then just anything else that I can think of to make sure we're very clear on the quality of goods. Uh, another thing is the moisture content of the bamboo. And this is actually isn't something I'd really even think of. But I noticed that some of the, the factories included it, so I'll go ahead and include that in there. Essentially, we don't want a really damp product that could potentially get moldy. Um, also, like I'm going to say, you know, we have a right to a third-party inspection. That. What's that again? Sorry. So th that seems like kind of a, a, a nebulous contract agreement. Like, how would you know if it's too moldy or too moist? Yeah. So to be completely honest with you, these kinds of things are very hard to actually enforce. Like, say, for instance, I paid for all these goods, they received at my house, and the moisture content was too high, right? Um, like, I can obviously work with this factory and say, like, hey, next time they need to be drier, or hey, I want my money back. But let's be completely honest. Do you really think I'm going to be able to get my money back from this factory in China uh, after the goods have arrived at my house? Uh, the answer is probably no, right? Or it would cost more money to try to get my money back than, uh, than the amount of money I actually spent on it. Um, what it does show to the factory is very clear on our expectations. So if I just send them an email just says, that doesn't like clarify anything, just says, hey, I want to go ahead and place this order, here's my deposit. Then it's like, okay, this guy, it doesn't really seem like he really cares that much. Um, you know, as opposed to if I, if I send all these details, it's very clear what I expect. It shows them that, you know, this is what I expect out of our relationship. Um, so it, it kind of just makes them, you know, like, let's double check that, you know, that our bamboo is pretty dry. Let's double check that um, this is the length, that kind of thing. You know what I mean? Yep. So, um, Got it. yeah, then included in there, I'm just going to say we have the right to a third-party inspection. I'm not going to tell them right off the bat whether we're going to actually do the inspection or not. And again, this just kind of holds them accountable. Um, I'm also going to tell them which pictures I expect at which steps. So like I said earlier in the webinar, I want a picture of like the raw materials um, after they grind the point on there, uh, after they print the stickers before they put them on the packaging, after they put them in the packaging, a full case, and so on. Uh, and the shipping info, I'm going to say, we have the right to use our own shipping company if uh, we deem we'd like to. Um, if not, these are the prices you quoted me for um, air cargo and uh, express shipping. Uh, you know, if I don't use my own, I'd like to use these at these prices. Uh, the payment terms, I've already asked her on Skype, and she agreed to 30, 70 payment terms. So that's 30% of the payment now, 70% once the goods are complete. And again, I'll send that 70 percent after I get some good pictures from her. Um, she agreed to in this first sh shipment that I could pay with PayPal. And then I'm also going to include a little pause in there that just says, I want uh, our relationship to kind of stay confidential. I don't want you to post pictures of my particular product on Alibaba 
or use it at trade shows and so on. Um, and I actually never thought of this before until I was at the Canton Fair a couple weeks ago, and I, I was seeing people's props that you know, like had the logo on them and stuff, and I actually recognized one or two of the companies. I'm like, man, I I don't know how I feel about that. I prefer for my companies not to use my particular product, and I doubt they ask these companies. So that's when I decide I'm going to go ahead and start throwing in this clause when I come up with a little purchase agreement with people or with factories. Got it. So. Um, is the purchase agreement necessary, or is, it, is this contract necessary? Is this what you do with every purchase that you run? Yeah, so it's definitely not necessary. And again, I've been kind of lackadaisical about this in the past, but uh, I'm going to start doing it on all. I'm going to start being better about this myself, and it never hurts. It's if nothing else, um, it clarifies things with the the factory. You know, it's. Um, it's good to give them as much clarity as possible. You know, I think some people get upset when they receive goods that aren't quite what they expected. And I think, you know, I like to give all these factories in China the benefit of the doubt. I like to think that they're going to be good uh, business relationships as long as there's good communication between both parties. You know, I think a lot of times that might be just as much of the buyer's fault as it is the factory's fault. So. You know, my opinion of it, it's always good just to have good, clear guidelines of what you expect out of them and then what they can expect out of you, you know, when they can expect to be paid and, you know, what goods you expect to receive. Absolutely. So, uh, good idea from Ron. He suggests to uh, ask for silica bags in the package regarding moisture. Okay. Yeah, that actually is a good idea. I'll ask about that. Um, yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, so th there were some questions as well about the branding and the logo. You showed us the uh, what was going to go at the very top of the uh, package. Um, so what work have you been doing on creating that the brand? Yeah, you broke up on me for a second there, but uh, what, it was, what are we doing for the brand? And so what we're going to do is on the sticker that we're creating, so, you know, that 100 by 140 millimeter sticker, we're going to put on there um, a little logo that we're going to come up with. And it's not going to be anything fancy. I guess um, maybe we can run a poll what we're named our company, but I was thinking about calling it Jungle Creations. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> or Jungle something. Maybe we'll do like a poll in the blog on our name. And then we're just going to come up with a little simple logo. Um, on that sticker, we'll also put, and we'll have a discussion about this in a second, but I guess we'll put the FN SKU as opposed to the UPC barcode. And then if there's enough room, maybe we'll include a little um, like s'mores recipe. Like we'll, we'll maybe call it like the Jungle Creations uh, best s'mores recipe. And we'll say like, Hey, instead of using a Hershey bar, use uh, a Heath bar for an added jungle crunch, or I don't know. <laughs> we could come up with like a little uh, recipe we could put on there too, just to um, yeah, uh, just to have a little something else on that sticker. And again, that just makes it a little bit harder for someone else to start selling on our item. It's like, well, do you have the Jungle Creations special s'more recipe on your sticker? Uh, if not, then uh, this is the listing for you. Jungle six. Okay, Tim, that's a pretty good one. So, uh, yeah. Um, okay, so real quick, since I brought that up, FN SKU versus uh, a regular UPC or EAN uh, barcode. Um, so let's, at the end of the day, it doesn't make that big of a difference. So let's talk about the pros and cons just real quick about both. So if you use the UPC or EAN barcode, and again, these are like the barcodes you buy from speedy barcodes, um, the, the pro of this is if you would ever decide to sell it uh, like locally or wholesale to someone else, this is like the same one that everyone uses. You know, like if I go into Target and I buy whatever from them, uh, a lampshade, it's going to have this UPC code on them, right? That's the one that they scan. Um, you can use this and send your product into Amazon and choose commingled inventory and you don't have to sticker it yourself, okay? Um, it's my understanding that, or I, I, 
I know this for a fact, actually, because I've made this mistake before. In health and personal care, that you can't do this for either most products or all products because they don't let you choose commingled inventory in health and personal care. There, this might actually also be true in a few other categories I've never sold on on Amazon. Um, so those items, you do have to have the FN SKU, and that's a SKU or a barcode that you generate from Amazon or Amazon creates. Um, so for our particular item, I'm going to go ahead and just print the FN SKU on our particular product. Um, and then you don't have to choose commingled inventory. You can just choose, I forget the exact terminology Amazon uses for the other one, but essentially just standard inventory. Um, and then we don't have to sticker any of these items once they arrive in the States. So we're going to receive them from the factory. We're going to open up a few cartons to make sure that uh, it passes our quality standards, and then we're going to forward them on to Amazon. So, yeah, a lot of people um, – I don't think, I'll see you guys some comments in here. I don't think commingled is that bad. Um, if you're doing like, if you're selling on brands that you don't own, I definitely see how it could be bad because if there are a bunch of sellers on this item, Amazon doesn't know which products are yours and then you could essentially or theoretically get in trouble for um, a product that wasn't yours. So like if someone sent in a defective product Amazon thought it was yours, but they had no way of knowing because it was commingled and sent it to someone else, then you could get in trouble for a product that never was yours. So if you're selling on someone else's listing, I definitely agree with you. It's good to sticker all of them yourself. If you're selling on your own listing, there shouldn't ever be anyone else selling on this listing. So theoretically, it shouldn't really matter. And I've sold a whole bunch of stuff commingled um, on my private labels, and I've never had any problems with it. So that's, eh, that's my uh, personal opinion on it. Got it. So, uh, Greg, real quick, back to the negotiations. Did you discuss minimum order quantity, or are you going to address the price? You mentioned you'd be willing to pay even a little bit more than she quoted. Are you going to negotiate that down to increase the profit margin? Uh, if I ordered a larger quantity, is that what you said? Well, yeah. Did, I mean, there were actually two separate questions. Did you discuss MOQ, and then are you going to negotiate price? Uh, so I didn't discuss MOQ. Um, I just told them, hey, I want 1,000 units. Everyone said that's fine. If I was play, trying to place a smaller order, uh, it would probably be up for discussion. Um, you'll find that most factories are willing to work with you at 1,000 units. So, uh, yeah, that I never had to negotiate on it. Um, the price that they gave me was after I already told them I wanted 1,000 units. And... If I do, I say if I follow up with this order with another order of 5,000 units, I'm going to ask for new pricing. So I'm going to say, hey, what will my pricing be if I order 1,000 versus 2,000 versus 5,000 versus 10,000 units? And then, again, I'll, I'd probably try to negotiate that uh, as well. And then the other question is negotiating on price. Um, yeah, we covered that a little bit. The factory number two that's my favorite, they originally – their original price in the game was three dollars and fifty cents per unit, and I got them down to two sixty four uh, per unit. So savings of what's that, eighty six cents or something. Excellent. So yeah, and uh, I'm not a great negotiator by any means. I don't know. Someone else might be able to negotiate them down further. Probably especially um, if you could speak Mandarin or something. But um, you know. I kind of discussed this before. I feel like once I get to a price that I feel like is a good price for me and it's a win-win situation for everyone, I usually just go with it. You know, could I have saved a few more cents? Probably, but it's, you know, I don't have a problem with, I understand how business works. You know, I want this factory to make a little bit of profit too. I want them to value my relationship because they're making some decent money off me. If I'm making their good money and they're making decent money, uh, I'm happy. Great. Yeah. So what are what are questions we have in there again? Uh, we we had a little bit uh, some more questions about uh, FN SKU and UPC and uh, commingled. Uh, if you have any, uh, Elizabeth shared the Amazon link for more info on commingled. But if you do have more insight into that, uh, people would love to hear that. 
Yeah, so a commingled product is when you're shipping something into Amazon, you have the option to select commingled. And if you do that, you don't put an FN SKU on it, which is a, like a unique identifier to you as the seller. So when you ship something in commingled, Amazon scans the UPC code, which is just like your standard barcode, like all the products have on it at Target or Walmart or anyone else. And when they sell this particular product, um, and I don't know how it all works on Amazon's end, but essentially they don't know exactly which seller that product came from when you're selling it. And these are for products that have multiple sellers. So like if I go on there and I, on Amazon, and I look at this water bottle, Hydro Flask, this isn't like a private label. This is just someone's brand who sells wholesale. So I would guess that there is like a bunch of sellers selling this particular water bottle. So if all those sellers shipped in a product with commingled into Amazon, when Amazon's selling all these each day, they don't know exactly which seller that this particular water bottle came from. You know, like uh, Joe Schmo might have gotten credit for this sale, even though uh, Jim Bob was the one who actually shipped this particular water bottle into Amazon. So if you're selling a product like that, there's multiple sellers on, you can see where that'd be a problem. Like what if I open this up and there was like dirt inside, so I returned it to Amazon saying like as an upset customer, then you know, maybe uh, Jim Bob's getting in trouble even though Don Smith or whoever I said was the one that uh, actually sent this in and, and that, that's where it can be a problem. Um, if it's your particular missing, you're the only one that's ever gonna sell on it because our jungle sticks, we're not ever gonna sell to other uh, you know, we're never going to wholesale to other sellers. That's when it doesn't make as big of a difference. If you're worried about it, though, you can't always go, go just go ahead and print the FN SKU on there, and they don't have to worry about it. Like I said, the only downside to the FN SKU is, say I did want to sell our jungle sticks to um, wholesale to other like companies, then I would need to put like that UPC code on there probably. But to be honest with you, if I were to do that, I'd go ahead and just place a new order from the factory anyway. And at that time, I could get some new labels printed up. So um, it's not that big of a deal either way. Uh, if you're not sure, just go ahead and just print the FN SKU on there. Like I said, also, if you're selling health and personal care and potentially other categories, they, do, they don't require COVID, or excuse me, they don't allow commingled. They require that you either have the FN SKU printed on there or the sticker. So in that case, um, the FN SKU is good to have. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then, so now, like you're you're ready to put in your order, the contract. Are you protecting yourself in any way as far as uh, Alipay or um, any kind of um, escrow, or is it just the PayPal assurance? So I am paying with this uh, via PayPal. Um, that's the, essentially the only protection that I have, which may or may not work if they don't actually deliver the goods. Um, I did a little bit of research on the company, the best I could just on their website, Googling the name to see if they showed up on like ripoff report. Uh, I forget, I think they have been on Alibaba for a while. Um, and then I'll probably try to do a little bit more due diligence before I actually send them that first payment. But um, so far, I haven't been getting any red flags. And again, all the pictures that I'm requiring them to take does protect me a little bit as far as that they're actually creating my item. Um, so yeah, who knows? Um, worst case scenario, they do run off of my 30% down payment and never create the item. Um, yeah, but again, of course there are scammers out there, but most of these factories do want to do a good job for you and create a good business relationship with you. Um, keep in mind, you know, we might be selling 20 or 30 these a day, which, you know, could potentially be 600, 900, 1,000 units a month, which, again, that's the kind of customer these factories would like to have that we're reordering 1,000 of these each month. Um, yeah, and more likely, we only sell 10 a day, but again, these companies want reorders, so, yeah, if, it, if you know, just do your due diligence. There are scammers out there, but 
most of these are companies that want to establish a long-term relationship with you. Sure. So uh, Carlos was asking how you prevent other sellers from getting on your listing or hijacking your listing. Are you making it, taking any measures to protect yourself there? Um, we can register for the brand registry, uh, which helps a little bit. And then essentially, if someone hops on our listing with, say, one product, I don't even worry about it. I just let them sell their one product on our listing and go about my business. If someone hops on our product with um, actual inventory, 10, 50, 100, 1,000 units or whatever, that's when you have to kind of escalate it. First, you can message the seller and say, hey, you know, you don't, uh, this is our brand. I don't think you have an identical product. So essentially, this is a counterfeit product. If you don't take it off, you know, within the next 24 hours, we're going to contact Amazon, let them know that you have a counterfeit product. If they don't, that's when we can go ahead and contact Seller Central. But um, to be completely honest with you, I've never had a big problem with this. I, I do see it occasionally pop up, like in the Facebook groups and stuff, that people do have these hijackers. Um, if you do differentiate your product, like I, I make sure to like take a picture of our um, like of our packaging and of our logo and stuff. So it's like, okay, if you don't have the same packaging and the same logo and stuff, then you don't have this exact same product. If you don't have, what did I call it again, our, our uh, jung uh, jungle s'more specialty, whatever. If you don't have that recipe on your sticker, then this isn't your product. You know, you need to have another listing for it. So um, yeah. How many units okay. does the hijacker have? You can try to add 999 to your cart, and if they only have like one, then you know right away that that's it. Uh, if they have some more, then you know that. All right, Greg, so looking forward, well, first of all, I think a couple people were curious about like the margin breakdown, like what the cost of the product is, plus the shipping, the landed price of the shipping, um, FBA fees. Can you just kind of review that uh, and then maybe what what you're going to sell it at? Yep. So that's a great question. And that's something I forgot to cover, so I'm glad people asked that. Um, let's see here. Let me find – all right. So this is, this is our competition for uh, the keyword marshmallow sticks. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and run Jungle Scout on this. Um, now keep in mind, some of these products we see are these metal sticks, whereas we are selling these bamboo ones. So let's see, this guy right here has a similar product. Um, his is only 30 inches long. He's selling for $27.65. And then our other competitor is this guy, um, $27.88. And this is essentially our same product. It's 36 inches. It has the same points and everything. So I'll probably list this um, at like the same price. Um, 27.88 or 27.95 or 27 something. So I don't ever like to compete on price. Um, I like to have a better listing, um, provide more value, whatever. I never, my ne my plan is never to go in there and try to sell it for a dollar cheaper. I don't I don't like that idea. Um, maybe for a, to get some initial sales to boost our BSR so we rank better. Maybe I'd price it at like. Uh, I price it lower for a few days just to get some initial sales, but like long term, I don't plan on competing against these guys with price. So if we look at it, actually the other one, since it's 36 inches, will probably be more accurate. So this is you know the price he's selling for. Um, our FBA fees should be almost identical to this guy's. It should weigh about the same. You see this is 36 inches, which is about 90 centimeters. Um, so yeah, since he's selling about the same thing, our fee should be this, about the same, about $10.60. So our landed cost was, I think, $8.13. So that would leave $9.15 for profit. Um, I'm going to go ahead and add in there about, it would probably be about a, I'll conservatively say a dollar. So let's say a dollar to factor in for um, shipping this item into Amazon, which the, uh, Amazon's UPS ground rates are dirt cheap, so it's probably less than a dollar. But that also gives me a little room to play for some pay-per-click. And then, um, so if I do that, you see my ROI, or you know, my, my profit would be $8.15, which... 
uh, is about, what's that, roughly 90% ROI, which is pretty good. And then remember, if I ship this next shipment, Ocean, uh, ocean freight, it's going to be significantly cheaper. All of a sudden, then my landing cost for my product is probably going to be like $5, which then all of a sudden I have a 250% ROI, which is pretty incredible. So, um, yeah, that's the breakdown. If you want, you can, you can do this a lot fancier. You can figure out, um, you can go ahead and get a quote from Amazon, how much it'll cost to ship it from your house into their fulfillment centers. You could um, come up with some estimates about how much you think you're going to spend on pay-per-click. Or if you're like me, you could just keep things simple and just uh, use some conservative numbers. And, uh, yeah, go from there. Great. So are you going to register for trademark or brand before launching? Any legal steps you're taking? Short answer. Uh, you can if you want. I think it's, I've never, honestly, never filed for a trademark before. I think it's pretty pricey. Uh, and attorney fees, um, people are telling me it's 1000 or $2,000 or whatever. In the U.S., is again, I'm not a trademark attorney, but my understanding is it's the first to use as opposed to, um, like, first to register. So say, like, Amazon.com never register their trademark. If I went in today and tried to register the trademark amazon.com, they wouldn't let me because I wasn't the first to use that. Amazon was. So if we call our brand Jungle Sticks, um, especially if I like register junglesticks.com, maybe throw up a basic landing page there, whatever, I essentially own that trademark even though it's never been registered. And um, so yeah, I'm not going to register the trademark and I don't really plan on doing any other stuff as far as legalities go. Excellent. So, Greg, we are at an hour. All right. Are there any other last questions we want to uh, wrap up on? Or let's see, guys. I uh, really did try. Um, so, yeah, if you have the Jungle Scout, it's obviously really easy calculating the profit there. Um, if you don't, you can just Google FBA fee calculator, and Amazon has one. It's a little bit clunky. Um, and you'll have to enter some more stuff there, but you can use that. Um, or if not, I know a lot of you guys use Jungle Scout, so you just click on the net value and that little FBA fee calculator pops up. So can you go over the timing for your next steps? Yeah, great question. Sure. So yeah, let's talk about the next few weeks here. So I'm hopefully going to wrap up this deal with Factory 2 within the next couple of days here. Um, I'm going to stay up tonight until... Um, things open up in China and try to work out the final little details, put together that little uh, purchase agreement. And then if everything's good to go, I'll probably try to do a little more due diligence on the factory. If everything looks good, I'll go ahead and pay the 30% um, after they've agreed to and signed the purchase agreement. Um, after that, they told me, they, actually, they told me 10 days lead time, but I always factor in a little room for error. So let's say 15 days. So if I got this, Let's see, today's the 11th. Um, let's say, again, give me a little room for error here. If I get this finalized by this Friday the 13th, um, uh, I guess that's an unlucky day, <laughs> then <laughs> hopefully, um, hopefully they can ship my product by, let's say, Black Friday, which is the 27th, or maybe that following Monday, uh, November 30th, which would mean that my first express shipment um, arrives uh, December 4th. So, yeah, timeline, that, that might be a little optimistic. We'll see how it goes, but we could potentially be holding some of these in our possession and taking photos of it on December 4th, which would be great. So, yeah. Um, so that all sounds good for the actual product. As far as webinar, let's do another one next week. We can go over some more details about payment. I'll give you guys the actual purchase agreement that I use and answer any other questions you have. And that will be kind of a inner, inner um, let's see, or, yeah, that sounds good. Let's do that. Another one next week. And then our following one will be actual, after the actual uh, product arrives. So actually, I, I totally forgot. Next week, let's also work on setting up our listing. So we can go ahead and work on setting up our listing. We'll kind of plan ahead of time a little bit before our actual product arrives. Okay. Uh, is this for Jungle Sticks? Chris is a big fan of Jungle Sticks. Actually, Elizabeth as well. 
everyone likes that name. The only problem is what if we add, want to add more products to our jungle creation line? They would have to that all be stick type items? <laughs> that's a great point. And that was actually a question that somebody had earlier. Um, how does this fit into like your overall, overall long-term strategy? So for the case study, it, it might just be marshmallow sticks, but supposing somebody was trying to build out a brand, like what would you be planning here in that case? Yeah, good question. So yeah, for our particular case study, we're probably not going to add more products. Um, for you, for all you listeners out there, it is a good idea to think about, um, you know, would I potentially want to add more products to this line? If so, do I want to name it something like Jungle Sticks? Because then it's probably going to need to be things that are sticks in my line. Or say like Jungle Creations, it's like, oh, that could be like anything in there. Um, and then, yeah, something you can think about is, okay, what else would go well with uh, Marshmallow Sticks? Uh, quick answers, I'm not quite sure. I have to do more research for this particular product. I didn't do it since, um, yeah, we're just, we're just going to do one. We're just launching one product to kind of help you guys out and do a, uh, you know, a little, a little case study here. So, yep, looks like we got uh, lots of uh, recommendations for names here. We'll have to look over them some after the webinar. Jungle Greg. <laughs> Jungle Craig. <laughs> All right. So yeah. Um, so let's go ahead and wrap it up. Or I like to keep these about an hour so things don't get too uh, drawn out and boring. Uh, you guys are probably sick of listening to me by now. But we'll plan on another webinar next week. We'll send you out an email with the exact day and time. We'll work on setting up our listing. I'll give you guys the purchase agreement that I use. We'll go over any other details that I uh, have with the factory or with ordering this product. And then um, after that, hopefully, like I said, on December 4th is the, uh, I guess, my tentative estimated uh, landed date of our products. So yeah. Exciting. That's awesome. Uh, so yeah, there, there definitely are some questions still coming in and we will address it in the blog. We'll uh, post a video re recap in the blog, uh, written recap as well if you prefer to read that. and. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll just make sure that we do share Greg's contract that he sends out and the spreadsheet of how he evaluates the different suppliers uh, and anything else that would uh, that would help. So um, yeah, I guess, Greg, that wraps it up for tonight, huh? All right, Gen. For those of you guys who didn't catch it, uh, Gen and I actually in the same room, right, are, well, we're sharing a wall uh, in front of me behind Gen here. So we'll, we're going to go get some dinner together and uh, I hope you guys enjoy your night. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Thanks, everyone. All right. See you later. Bye. Bye.